of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Imagine what that will be like one day when we get uh, cross over into eternity's shore, we will get to look upon the Lord forever and ever and ever, but we don't have to wait till then, right? We get to cast our eyes on Him this morning. Father, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. God, we thank you for what you do. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, we just pray for our service this morning. We pray, Lord, that you'll be glorified through all that is said and done. And Lord, we just thank you that we can cast everything upon you at your feet. And we ask you, Lord, to be pleased with our worship, with our time of prayer, and prepare our heart even now for the word as it comes forth in just a few minutes. Lord, we'll give you thanks, we'll give you praise, we'll give you glory, and we'll give you honor. And we do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship Him. Hallelujah. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name 
that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. In just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. In just one word, and you revive every dream. In just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. In just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Let's join our hearts together as we sing this. I will believe. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall He can't break through. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Amen, hallelujah. There's nothing that our God can't do. Hallelujah. You may be seated, Pastor Crystal. Just a few quick announcements for you this morning. There is youth ministry tonight at 6.30 p.m., so 7th through 12th graders. I hope I'll see you there. Ladies, the next Women's Connection is this Tuesday at 6.30, so mark that on your calendar. Bring a friend. Next Sunday is New Life Sunday. Uh, if you're a part of that service, please make sure that you know all the details. If you don't, please make sure that you see either me or Pastor John today so we can get you those details. And... Uh, if you're not participating in that service, be here. That's how you're participating, to support those who are um, being baptized and uh, making these decisions for the Lord. And then finally, Mother's Day is fast approaching. That is on May 14th. We invite you to be a part of that service. That morning, we will have evangelist Tracy Weiss here to speak. And again, that service is, is for everyone, but all the special things that day are for all women. You do not have to um, wear that title, Mom, to be part of that special day. Uh, it's for all women who come. There will be a special luncheon and there will be um, an opportunity to get either a basic manicure or a hand massage. So we hope that you'll be a part of it. And yes, there will be uh, some child care for those who do have children and lunch for them. And I believe there is going to be something special for the guys too, so that while you're waiting for your wife, you don't have to just be hungry. So. <laughs> we'll have something good for your belly that day for sure. 
uh, but we just pray that you'll you'll come and be a part of that service. Make sure you take one of those invites. There is one announcement that Pastor Chris was unaware of, and there's some flyers at the information table, but there's a Lan- the National Day of Prayer is coming up on Thursday, May 4th, and Lancaster County used to do it so each community would do their own thing. Now Lancaster County has tried to unite all of those regions and those areas, and they're just having one central location. So that's being held at Calvary Church. There's a flyer that looks like this back at the information table. If, there, if we've run out of flyers, we'll certainly make some more and have them available next week. But there is some information, so if you're interested in being a part of that or uh, you know anything, uh, please make sure that you stop by and pick up one of those flyers. So, uh, you know, I was thinking the other day and just spending some time in praying with the Lord. And uh, as you see, we have the offering plates out here. And so we've we've brought them back. And in just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to shake somebody's hand, hug them around the neck, let them know that you're glad to see them. But we're also going to give you opportunity in the midst of doing that to come and to bring your tithe and your offering and put it in the offering plate. And I was reading through the book of Malachi in chapter number three, and there's a portion of scripture that you might be familiar with uh, in terms of God t- asking or telling Israel to, to challenge him in this area. But it's interesting, uh, he talks about robbing God. And there's actually two areas that God mentions to the religious leaders, because that's really who Ma- uh, Malachi is talking to. He's talking to the priests, he's talking to the Levites, but he's talking about robbing him in the tithe and the offering. But he's also talking about robbing him of the devotion and worship that he is so due. And it really struck me in that because so many times we categorize what we do in the church. There's a time of this, and then there's a time of that, and then there's a time of this, and then there's a time of that. God's not interested in all of the categories. He's interested in the position of our heart. And so what I want to do today is give you opportunity in just a moment to come and, and to put your, your tithe in the in the uh, tither you're offering in the in the uh, plates that are up here there's giving envelopes if you want to use those they're in the seat backs in front of you and you can certainly take a moment but in doing that would you shake somebody's hand would you let them know that you're glad to see them maybe you already put a tithe uh, in the blo- in the box that's hanging up back there and that's certainly fine too then spend some time and uh, just greet one another so stand with me take this moment the band's just going to play for a couple of moments but greet someone let them know that you're glad to see them and come bring your tithe and your offering into the storehouse and Watch that God won't do something miraculous with it. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like his power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do oh there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a prison wall he can't break through 
Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing our God can't do. Nothing our God can't do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you this morning. You're good. Would you take a moment and just tell the Lord he's good. Tell him he's good. Lord, we worship you. You're good this morning. You're so faithful. You're so faithful, Lord. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails. Not in my key. <clears throat> no. Goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the good. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing. The goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will say. Goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so The goodness of God. Your goodness is running. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running 
running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you've been faithful. of the goodness of God. Sing that part. Your goodness is running. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you is running after it's running at one more time your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am sing of the goodness of God. Sing all my life, one more time, all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah that you're good. Hallelujah, you're good. Worthy, 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 worthy. You're worthy.
of the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise Church worthy, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Oh, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Oh, more time worthy worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise oh worthy is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise oh worthy my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your I stand amazed in your love undeniable. Your grace goes on and on, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Oh, worthy is your 
your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names and be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name of, one more time be exalted be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise Worthy is your name, worthy is your name, Jesus, you deserve the praise, worthy is your
I'm so thankful that the Lord still speaks. And I'm thankful that we're a church that is open to that, and not only open to it, but ready for it, hungering for it. Because I, I believe, honestly, that the Lord wants to speak anytime His people are gathered together. But not everybody who gathers together is ready to hear from the Lord. And I'm so thankful that we're a body of believers who is. I, I hope that when the Lord's speaking, you're listening. But just, you know, we all go through different things. And some seasons are great seasons and other seasons are, eh. And, and sometimes we're on the mountaintop and sometimes we're in the pit of the valley. And sometimes we're somewhere in between. But God just said this morning, I have not changed. <laughs> and it doesn't matter where you are, what path you're on, what you've been through, where you're headed. He has not changed. He went on to say, I will not change. Would you just take 20 seconds, lift your hands toward heaven and just worship him. He's worthy. Use your own words and just call it out this morning. Be vocal. Let them know that he's worthy. Let them know that, that, that you love him. Let them know that it doesn't matter the circumstance or situation, but he is good. He's your redeemer. He's your healer, and he wants to pour out. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you don't go back on what your word says. You don't go back on your promise. We don't have to wonder tomorrow if you're the same as you were today. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise and we give you glory and we give you honor because no one else is worthy of it. No one else is worthy of it. God, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for visiting us in this place and Lord, you're not done. You still have more for us this morning. You still have more that you want to pour out, more that you want to say, more that you want to do in our hearts. You want to change us and transform us. And Lord, so here we are. We're open to you and what you have for us this morning. Lord, prepare our heart right now for that word as it gets ready to come forth. Be with our kids as they get ready to go back to their classes and continue, Lord, to build on that firm foundation that is being built in their lives, the foundation, the rock of Jesus Christ. Father, continue to pour your spirit out. We'll give you thanks, we'll give you praise, we'll give you glory, and we'll give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Give them a one more clap offering this morning. He's worthy. You may be seated. We're going to go ahead at this time and dismiss our kids back to their classes. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody who's sitting near you and tell them, say, God is good. Now turn around to somebody else and tell them the same thing. Say, God is good. <laughs> Today we're going to continue in our Run Your Race series that we started last week. And last week we took a look at two portions of scripture, the first one coming from 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verses 7 and 8. And I'm going to take a couple minutes this morning and just kind of give a, a quick review of what we talked about because we're, we're really just going to continue on through that as we transition into this morning's message. And so I just want to take a couple of moments. If you were here, it's a great review. If you weren't, now you're all caught up or you will be all caught up as we continue to move forward. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verses number 7 and 8, page 965, if you're using a Bible in the chairs there in front of you or behind you or under you. But Paul says this, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Two things we brought out of that portion of scripture. Number one, you and I must live with eternity in mind. You and I have to live this life with eternity in mind. And we talked last week, uh, you know, some of us have begun planning vacations and, and we pick our date, we pick our location, we make the date, we make the reservation, everything's set, and then we begin to make plans so that we can depart on time, so that we can leave on time, and that we can take whatever we need to enjoy that trip or that vacation or whatever it is. And so often, though, when it comes to our spiritual life, we don't live with eternity in mind. We just try to get through this and that in the, in the moment. And you and I, as, as Paul says here, should live with eternity in mind, live with the end in mind. The decisions and the choices that you and I make today will impact eternity. The decisions that you and I make today will impact eternity. You could be leaving here today, headed to a restaurant, the Lord nudges you and, and, and prompts you to talk to someone, you decide as scary as that is, you're going to follow his prompting, you're going to have an opportunity to talk to somebody, pray with someone, and they might ask the Lord into their life to be their Lord and Savior. Eternity has just been affected forever. We don't think about that, do we? No, we don't. Very, many, very often we do not think about that. Number two, Paul considers the Christian life the good fight. The only one worth fighting. I gave a long list last week, but a couple of things that he fought against. He fought against Satan, God-defying behavior, religious hypocr hypocrisy, immoral behavior, uh, abuse of spiritual freedom, false teachers, and other kinds of things. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, we're going to lead, read lots of scripture today, so get your page-turning fingers ready. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, Paul continues to write to the church in Corinth. In 2 Timothy, he talk, yeah, 2 Timothy, he talked about the end. Here in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the race that's at hand. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, beginning in verse number 24, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You and I do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be, uh, I'm sorry, will not be disqualified for the prize. The runners, the literal runners that he's talking about, run to get a crown that will not last, but you and I, in the running of our spiritual journey, if you will, we do it for a prize that will last forever. You and I are going to go to eternity. We're going to go to heaven someday. I hope you're excited a little bit more than you're showing right now, because you're going to be in the presence of Jesus, and nothing else will matter. When that moment, when you slip from this life into the next, you will not be concerned about those who have been left behind. You will not be concerned about your next mortgage payment. You will not be concerned about whether your car needs a new muffler or if it needs new brakes or if it's going to pass inspection. Fine. You're not going to worry about anything because you're going to be in the presence of Jesus. And you and I are running this race to win the prize, to make it to heaven, to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Verse number 26, he says, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. You and I must live life with purpose. 
There's a purpose when you get up in the morning and you say, all right, I'm going to spend these first few minutes with Jesus. I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time in his word. I'm going to do the things that I know I need to do, know that I should do, and hopefully that you desire to do. Living life on purpose. Doing it for, there's a reason we carve out those moments to be able to spend, whether it's five or 50 or somewhere in between or beyond. But there's reason that we do it. It's to be filled up. It's to be uh, 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 sanctified. It's to get the word of God in us so that we might not sin against him. It's to be encouraged and uplifted. It's to allow the joy of the Lord to permeate our situation. There's reason that we spend time with him. There's reason that we hopefully turn off the phone, not just set it aside and listen to see if it buzzes or rings, but we set it aside and we enter his presence in prayer and we just stop everything and say, here, Lord, I'm here. Dear Lord, I'm here. Here I am. Change me. Here I am, speak to me. Here I am, Lord, and all my stuff. God, here I am. We spend those moments purposefully. If there's no purpose, it's just a to-do list, and it's really not going to change you the way God hopes and intends that it will change you. God loves you so much, he doesn't want you to stay where you're at today. You and I can't haphazardly go through life and deal with it as it comes we prepare we're in the word we know the word we're praying life will happen but it's how you and I respond that's important today I want to take a few moments and talk to you about the things that you and I can do, can do to prepare for our race last week I mentioned two of them and I'd like to go just a little bit deeper and add a third today as we as we get into this because I think it's so important and some of this you might say well I, I already know about that or I know I was listening last week I already heard but but this morning I've been praying that God will do something deeper that, that it's not just going to be, yeah, I already heard that before, or I hear you say that a lot, but God will allow his word to just go a little deeper in our hearts. How many of you could use going a little deeper with the Lord this morning? That's a lot of us. Thanks for your honesty. Thanks for being real and, and being raw. The first thing that we talked about last week was watch what you eat. Right? We've been talking about running this race, and I've been likening that to, to my uh, journey in terms of preparing for a marathon and getting ready to do that. And, and one of the things that we learned is it's not just about getting a good pair of sneakers and going out and running a couple of miles, but when people are training for a race, it's more than just good shoes and the miles. Everything that happens in life affects your body as you prepare for a race. And the journey that you and I are on as believers is a marathon. It's not a sprint. How many of you ever watched track and field, right? And the 100-meter dash is over like by the time you get a sip of your soda and eat four chips. These guys are done and they're across the line, right? You're like, wow, I can never do that. <laughs> that's, just, that that's, just, that's just crazy. And then you see other races where they're running for 10 minutes and 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hours. Can eat a couple of meals and it takes to these guys to run their race and we're like, I can't do that. But our spiritual journey is like a marathon because should the Lord tarry, we're going to be here for a little while. Hopefully. I hope you desire to be here. Yes, we want to be with Jesus. Yes, we want to go home. But I'm not in a rush to get there in that he'll take me when he takes me, whether it's the second coming of Christ or I breathe my last breath. But I'm happy to be here for a little while longer. I got some kids I'd like to see get married, some grandbabies I'd love to love on and then hand back because I hear that's the best part. My wife and I were in the living room a couple of nights ago, and she made some popcorn. I said, you want me to put some M&Ms in them? 
And she said, ew, no. I said, well, that's what my mom used to do for our kids. And she said, well, it was actually Skittles, but that's gross. See, as a parent, you think it's gross. As a grandparent, you're like, yes, dump the sugar in. Right? I don't want to miss out on that. That's great. My kids, they cried, and we were still with them, and they kept crying. My mom was like, here. You know, she couldn't have smiled any bigger handing them back. She was the reason they were crying. No, we won't get into that. You and I have to watch what we eat. The type of food, the quality of food, and the quantity of food. Last week I talked about how we need to watch what goes in because we have to be careful because what goes in will come out. The words that we speak, Luke 6, 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man, the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. But can I just go a step further and say this, what you and I take in will not only come out, but it will also affect your lifestyle. It can also affect the choices that you make. What you decide to sit down on a Friday or Saturday and binge watch on Netflix or Hulu, whatever non-Christian music you're partaking of and getting into you, will affect you. And so it's not just, is it vulgar words coming out of our mouth, although we certainly do need to be careful of that, but when we fill ourselves with ungodly things, those things are going to begin to affect how we think. They're going to begin to affect how we act. They're going to begin to affect the choices that we make. Because when God's not on the throne, we live differently than when God is on the throne. You say, well, I'm a believer. I I spend time with Jesus every day. Outside of that devotion time, how much is Jesus on your mind? If you're watching horror movies, now listen, I'm not trying to be legalistic here. That's really not my heart. I'm not sitting here telling you to cancel all your subscriptions and call the cable people and just get it disconnected. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I think as good stewards of the temple of God, we need to be careful what we're putting in. Because the scripture says that the Holy Spirit resides here. So what am I putting in that he dwells with? That's between you and the Lord. But let's not be surprised if we're going to binge watch horror movies, if we're going to fill ourselves up with movies that are violent and, and have the vulgar profan and all of these things, and then we suffer with anxiety and depression and say, God, where are you? Let's be careful that we're not digesting all of that stuff and then blaming God when he doesn't come through how we expect him or in our timing or in the way that we're asking. I shared with you several times that, you know, when COVID first broke out, I I began to watch the news religiously, and I didn't use that word on purpose, I did use that word on purpose, not by accident, and and it began to affect me. And it wasn't until my wife graciously said something to me that I realized the grip that it had. And so I had to make a choice, Not, not because my wife said so, but because I realized the truth in what was said. So what am I going to do? Am I going to believe God and his word or I'm going to keep doing what I think is best for me to do? And as we take in these things that are unhealthy, 
It's going to affect not just the words that we speak, but the things that we do and the choices that we make. I love me a good dessert. I have it before dinner, during dinner, and after dinner if I would be allowed. I have no problem with that. Sneaking a piece before dinner, having it with my dinner, and a big piece for dessert. I'm okay with that. But then when I go for a run tomorrow morning, and I feel like there's 14 cinder blocks tied to each leg, that's not God's fault. That's not my wife's fault. It's not my kid's fault. It's not your fault. It's my fault. Because I've not been a good steward of what has been entrusted to me. The second thing that we talked about last week was keeping ourselves hydrated. What are you refueling yourself with? In John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. He was talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And he, he asked her to give her some water, and, and he did, or she did, and then he begins this conversation comparing the earthly water that she just drew up out of the well with spiritual water, with eternity. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And that Greek word for drink is in the present imperative tense, and it means a continual repeated action. You and I continue to drink of the water that Jesus gives. We continue to run to his word and drink of the water. We continue to be ministered to through the Holy Spirit. It's not a one and done. Jesus, come into my life. I'm saved. Now I go do what I want to do. No, that's not what it is. It's a continual refreshment. It's a continual hydrating with Jesus. It's a continual being renewed in his presence every moment of every day. Not a one and done. Not a once a week on a Sunday when you come to church and hope that carries you through till next Sunday. Because many believers live life that way. I'm going to soak in everything God has for me on Sunday. I'm going to go home, put my Bible on the shelf, and I'll know exactly where it is next Sunday morning when I get in the car and head back to church. Maybe you're, maybe I just described you. And maybe I didn't, but it's a continual drink. In verse 14, when Jesus says that, the water I, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. A continual, repeated action. It's not momentary, it's not single experience, it's our ongoing lifestyle. There's a third point that I want to give to you this morning, and it's developing your maintenance plan. Watch what you eat, watch what you're refueling with, and you need to develop a maintenance plan. There's two areas under that. The first one is you and I need to get proper sleep. Uh, Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And it's interesting, even something little like the punctuation. Your Bible says, be still, comma, And know that I am God. That's improper English, by the way. Because proper English would not have the comma. 
But God's not speaking to you and I in proper English. He's trying to give us a directive. Be still. Pause. And when you're still, you'll know that I am God. It's not be still and know. It's be still and know that I am God. You and I can't begin to fathom the completeness of who God is. Now, we'll never understand the completeness. I understand that. He's, his ways are higher than his thoughts are. I, we can't begin to understand the fullness of God while we're still going. We can't begin to understand who he is until we stop. Because there is a literal instruction here, be still. A literal translation of that word is enough. My sister and I used to fight to the point that when my mother yelled, we couldn't hear her. That's how loud we were. That's how much we were just tuning out the rest. And so instead of stop, she gave up on stop because we just, whoop, stop. Who said stop? She'd say, enough. And that was just enough, the pitch and, and how she said it was just enough, like, hmm? She did it. Stop. The Hebrew says, let go. Hmm. Be still. We need to stop or let go to the things that distract us, the things that weigh us down spiritually, the things that keep us from honoring God, the things that keep us from giving Him His proper place in our life. God has everything under control. He has everything under control. I'm going to say it one more time and then finish the sentence. He has everything under control and does not need your help. My help. He doesn't need our help. That's why he says, be still, comma, pause, stop, and know that I am God. Let go and let me do my thing. Sometimes I wonder if he would say, stop, you're messing it up. My wife is a very nice person, and every once in a while, I like to be in the kitchen helping her, because I like to be around her, and I, I think sometimes she wants to do, stop, and get out of the kitchen. I think she just shook her head, yes, just very subtly, just, just oh, yeah, a little bit. But, but I, <laughs> I say that lightheartedly, but I wonder how many times God's like, get out of my kitchen. Stop messing it up. Be still. God's all powerful. One day, his word tells us, one day everyone who ever lives will recognize and acknowledge that fact. One day every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He doesn't need our worry. He doesn't need our doubt. He doesn't need our processing. And he doesn't need to inform us of, what ne of what's next. He's got this. It's also interesting because that word, be, that phrase, be still, means to draw towards God. So we stop what we're doing, we stop the doing, we stop the pursuing other things, because that's really what we're doing in that moment. We stop doing what we're doing and we pursue God. We're Allow God to consume us. Be still and know that I am God. Stop what you're doing and be drawn to me. 
Stop your worrying, your doubting, your processing, your wanting to know what's next, and draw towards me. Be consumed by me. God's asking us to draw towards him, to allow him to consume our thoughts, to consume our desires, to consume our will so that he can replace them with his. When was the last time you consumed more of him? When was the last time in the being still that you let go of the situation and you grabbed a hold of him? When's the last time that we said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done? Jesus didn't just say it because of his situation. I believe he modeled it for you and I as well. Not my will, but yours be done. God, not my timing, but yours be done. God, not my answer, but yours be done. God, not my way, but yours be done. You and I need that proper sleep, that proper rest. The second thing is we have to treat the injuries. Sometimes life hurts. Psalm chapter number 34, verses 17 and 18. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18. The righteous cry out, the Lord hears them. He delivers them from their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I'm concerned that the body of Christ is feeding the wrong desires. We're feeding sinful desires. We're feeding anxiety. We're feeding fear. We're feeding anger. And we're feeding dis- uh, depression. We're not allowing the Lord to do the deep healing that's needed in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. I'm also concerned that when he attempts to do the healing, that you and I get uncomfortable and we pull away. We pull back. And in that, we don't want him to do what he died to do. Notice I said not what he desires to do, it's what he died to do. He died so that broken things could be made whole. So why would he want you to live broken? You ever read the scriptures and sometimes there's a letter of the alphabet and and then you have to find that letter at the bottom or in a margin or a column and it defines it, right? It it tells you why that letter's there. Anybody understand what I'm, I'm saying? You've seen those things? Nowhere in there when it says that Jesus died for the sins of the world is there a letter A and it says, accept your name. It doesn't say that. He doesn't desire for you to live broken. He doesn't desire for you to live hurting. He doesn't desire for you to live hopeless. He doesn't desire for you to live without joy. He doesn't desire for you to live without peace. He doesn't desire you to have broken relationships. He doesn't desire you to have a broken marriage. He doesn't desire you to live with uh, 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 any sort of disease or sickness. He doesn't desire those things. So Why do we pull away when he tries to heal us? Why, why, do, why do we pull away when, when he says, hey, I, I see that hurt, and, and now's the time that I want to begin to gently remove that brokenness and put all your pieces back together? C.S. 
See, when you're, when you're running uh, and preparing for a race, you've got to take time to nurse the injury. About, about a year and a half ago, I started running, and I decided on September 1st, I was going to run a 5K race on September 17th. That was dumb. Don't do that. And I trained, and I ran the race, and it, it didn't go too bad. About three weeks later, I pulled a muscle in my back. I don't know why it happened. I don't know how it happened. And so I decided I'm going to take a day off. Nothing wrong with taking a day off. And so I took a day off and I went running the next day. And ooh, it wasn't too long. I started feeling that again. But I thought, I'm going to push through it because I got this. And so I decided to run six miles that day and four and a half of them with this excruciating pain right about, right, right about here where the top of the microphone pack sits on my back. And, and I was able to finish it and that was not smart. And it ended up hurting for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And I couldn't run. Two weeks after it happened, I, I had entered a race and I tried to do it. I said, I haven't run in two weeks, but you know what? It's all right and it'll be fine. It wasn't hurting me normally, just normal wear and tear, normal doing what I was doing. And I got about 15 steps after this, the shotgun start. And oh, the pain, it was crippling. And so I just dropped out of the race and I gave up running, not doing it anymore. And so many times the believers live their spiritual life that way. We're going along, we're loving Jesus, we're going to church, we're, we're doing the things that we think we need to do, we're spending that time, we're even giving him that opportunity and that space to pour into him, and then something happens and we get hurt. And it, Whatever the hurt is, because it hurts, right? That's what hurt is. And so sometimes we'll say, you know what, I'm just going to push through it. I'm just going to work through it. God will, God will sort out all the details. He'll figure it out, and, and, and it'll be fine. And we just keep going. And there's this brokenness. There's this pain that's on the inside. And we just pretend it's not there. And we just keep pushing through and pushing through and pushing through. And we either push it, and then what happens when we push through it, it gets buried. And we think we vote, we're over it. Oh, that happened. I, I'm not bothered by that anymore. That was like three weeks ago, and, you know, whatever, and it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And so we'll either leave it there, or then something else happens just a little while later. And not only then are you dealing with that hurt, but that typically pricks the thing that just happened a few weeks ago. And so not only are you dealing with the instance at hand, but then there's this other thing from a couple of weeks ago that's not as big as the thing that just happened right now. At least it doesn't seem that way in the moment, but it's, it's, it's stirring some of that up. Oh, we're just going to keep going. And we keep going and we keep going. Until some point, it could be two weeks down the road, it could be two months down the road, it could be two years down the road. At some point, something happens and we break. And can, can I tell you that when you get to that point, it's ugly. Why? Because we're living broken. I'll never forget sitting across the table from somebody who unfortunately was living that situation that I just, that, that picture that I just painted for you. And I remember them saying to me, and two years ago you did this, and 18 months ago you said that, and three weeks before that you said this. And, and, and I just looked, I'm listening, I, I'm, I'm processing. And they said, don't you remember? And I said, honestly, no. That was two years ago. If this was an issue, we should have dealt with that two years ago. Well, why are we dealing with this right now? I'm not saying what you're saying is not valid. I'm not saying I didn't say it. I'm saying I can't answer to that because that was two years ago. 
I'm sorry. God desires to bring healing to our body. God wants to bring healing to you today. Galatians 5, verse number 7, Paul says this to the church in Galatia. It's towards the end of his letter. He says, you are running a good race, but who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? Now, he's talking about false teachers there who come in and, oh, Paul, you don't want to listen to Paul. I, I have the real gospel. And, and he's, that, that, that uh, false teacher was in there trying to trip up their theology. You were running a good race. You were on course. You were doing the right things. But someone cut in on you, and they kept you from obeying the truth. Can I tell you today that unforgiveness will keep you from obeying the truth? Your brokenness will keep you from obeying the truth. Because you, you don't want to enter into the fullest capacity because you don't want the Lord to bring that back up. Here's the thing. God doesn't bring things back up. God deals with them and heals us. He brings it up to the sense that he says, I'm ready to deal with this now because you're allowing me to do it. But God's not in there trying to prick that sore spot to make it hurt. God's not in there trying to scratch open scabs to make you bleed. God's not in there trying to do anything that's going to hurt you or harm you. God says, I, in the most gentle of hands, with the most loving of hearts, want to take this brokenness, this hurt, this pain, these thoughts, this situation, this unforgiveness, you can keep going with whatever it is that your pain is. And he says, I want to remove it from you and bring healing. It might be physical healing, it might be spiritual healing, it might be mental healing, it might be relational healing, marital healing. It, it, it doesn't matter one specific category because he's healer of it all. That's what he desires. But if we're honest, many times we don't want the Lord to do those deep healings. And we push him back and we don't allow him to do what he died to do and the result is you and I living broken, you and I living not free, because freedom is how the Lord desires you and I to live. In His freedom, not in our suppressing the hurt, thinking we're free. You want to transition up to the keys? When I got hurt those 18 months ago, almost two years ago, when I got hurt, not only did it affect my back, but I realized when looking back, it affected a lot of areas of, in my life. I let it affect a lot of areas in my life. Some depression started creeping in. The enemy started yapping his gums. You're a failure. See, you can't do it. You tried. You're a loser. And rather than pushing those things back like the Word instructs us to do, it's easy to just buy into that. It's easy to start believing those things. It's easy to start letting those thoughts run their course.
If it, gets to the, if it gets to the certain point, then you know what? Why even go into the presence of the Lord? He doesn't want somebody like me. He, doesn't, he can't love somebody like me. I've messed up too many times. I've failed too many times. Anybody else ever had this circle or am I just, okay, just a couple of us. That's good though. Thanks for being honest. Thanks for being honest. And the sad part is, is none of those things were reality. The reality is I just didn't take care of myself. Because I refused to be still. I refused to, in that moment, let myself be consumed by him. And in a very natural and practical sense, I just refused to stop and let my body rest for a couple of days. What's the hurt that you're carrying around that's got you all bound up? What anxiety and fear has taken lodging place in your heart and your mind? What anger have you allowed to fester? I recognize I might be talking to every single person in here. I realize it might just be one. But I really feel like the Lord wants us to take a few moments this morning. And if you would allow him, because he desires, if you would allow him, he wants to take that hurt and that pain and not pick open scabs. He wants to put your brokenness back together. He wants to bring a healing that can only come from the throne room of God in your life. Will you stand with me as we close? I want to give an invitation this morning. These altars are open. If you're struggling, if there's a brokenness, if there's an inner healing that you need, would you slip out of your seats and come to the altar this morning? Would you take that step of faith and say, Lord, here I am. Heal me. My wife and I, several months ago, were sitting across the table from couple of individuals and the statement was made, listen, we'll just bury the hatchet. Listen, God's not in the burying the hatchet business. God's in the business of forgiveness. God's in the business of healing. If I bury anything, as long as I remember where it is, I can go back. I can dig it up. I can go get it. about we not bury hatchets and we just allow the Lord to bring healing to our situations. If that's you this morning, I invite you to step out. I'm not passing microphones. I'm not asking people to publicly declare what it is. But if that's you, would you step out? Because I really sense 
as I was preparing the message a couple of weeks ago, started preparing, I really felt like the Lord was taking us in one direction. But this past week, I was, I was thinking as I was contemplating and I was praying, I really feel like this is the direction that the Lord wants us to go today. Sometimes just the subject matter makes us uncomfortable. God doesn't want you to run any longer. I believe the Lord is telling us today you don't have to pretend that everything's okay. In fact, I believe the Lord's saying it's okay to not be okay. Just don't stay there because I desire to bring healing. I desire to bring wholeness. going to take a couple of moments and pray for those who are in the altar. I'm going to ask my wife to come and pray with me so we can pray together. And for those of you that are in your seats, would you just begin to pray? Would you begin to maybe intercede on behalf of whatever the needs are that those who are in the altar come with? And, and could I also challenge you? Would you begin to say, Lord, is there anything in me God, is there anything in me that needs healing? Is there anything in me that needs touch? God, is there anything in me that I need to surrender over to you? And if there is, slip out of your seat and come pray. Jesus, look to Jesus, lifted high for our pain. Look to Jesus, look to Jesus, look to Him again.
time's time for confession. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Lifted high on the tree. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. the same one, he's the same one, all eternity, Thank you. 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. God's so good, church. It's a sweet presence of the Holy Spirit here this morning. Father, we come to you this morning and just in all of who you are and what you do. We thank you that while we might be able to hide something or keep something concealed from a spouse or a friend or a fellow believer, Lord God, there is nothing <laughs> that we can conceal from you. There's nothing we can keep hidden. There's nothing that you're unaware of or don't know about. And so, Father... Holy Spirit, would you continue to minister to our hearts as we get ready and leave this place today? Would you continue to do the work that only you can do? Do that healing, that restoration. Do those things, God, that we can't take credit for that only you can be given credit for. God, we thank you for the ability that we have to be in your house today. And as we say this final amen, we recognize you're not done moving. You're not done working. You're going to continue to do the things that you've set in motion this morning. So, Father, help us to be open to your spirit, open to what you're doing and how you're moving and working the rest of this afternoon and this evening and even tonight as we lay our head on the pillow. Tomorrow when we get up, let us continue to rest in the goodness of who you are. Because you love us too much to keep us where we are. Now, Father, we just speak your blessing upon your people as we get ready and leave this place today. Go before them, lead, guide, and direct them in all that they do. We ask you, Lord, that you not only bless them, but make them a blessing to others. Continue to empower us as we are your hands and feet this week. Let the light of Christ shine bright in our lives. And Father, we pray that you get all the credit, the glory, and the honor. Because, Lord, we're not worthy, but you are. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. And we thank you that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We give you thanks and praise and glory and honor, and we do it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Will you give the Lord one more clap offering this morning? He's good. He's worthy. Hallelujah.
Ladies, don't forget about the women's ministry meeting, women's connection group meeting this Tuesday at 6.30. Next Sunday morning is New Life Sunday. We are excited as we celebrate all that God is doing here at LifeSpring. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. You are dismissed.